popular, active and effortlessly brilliant, Hawking appeared to be living a charmed life. He left Oxford with a first-class degree and moved to Cambridge to do a PhD in cosmology. To the outside world he seemed unstoppable and his future looked brilliant. But things were not quite as rosy as they appeared. He came back at Christmas and it was a very cold year. And we normally went skating on the lake at St Albans. So we went skating on the lake at St Albans. And he fell down and couldn't get up. So we went and had coffee. And then he told me, which he hadn't, he had, he had been aware of this coming on, but he didn't know what it was, of course. But he hadn't passed it on, we didn't know. Hawking then revealed to his mother that for months he'd been having problems with his coordination. He'd had trouble tying his shoelaces and walking, and once he'd fallen down a flight of stairs and struck his head so badly that he'd temporarily lost his memory. It was clear he should go for tests. Stephen walked in out of the blue, and so we agreed to have lunch together, and he bought some drinks, put them down on the table, and spilt the beer. Uh, oh, God, I said, drunk again, and it's only 12.30. And then he told me that he'd just come out of hospital where he'd had a whole series of tests, and they told him that he had motor neurone disease, which I had never heard of at the time and explained to him that he would gradually lose the use of, of his entire body, that his brain would remain fully working, but that at some stage he would be unable to communicate with the world outside, and that eventually only his heart and his lungs would be working, and he would be essentially trapped inside this body. It was a great shock to be diagnosed with motor neuron disease. Why should this happen to me? It wasn't fair. But then I realized life wasn't fair. I saw the boy in the next bed in hospital die of leukemia. Clearly, I was better off than him. Though he put on a brave face, Hawking's world was shattered. Ever since he was a boy, lying in the grass with his father looking up at the sky, he'd wanted to be a scientist. Now, just as he was starting a whole new chapter of his life at Cambridge, he was told he had just two years to live. That was a dreadful year. He was very depressed, but I think well, he's, he is a fighter, and I think that aspect came up pretty quickly. I think the time when I realised how tenacious he could be was um, at the time that he had had to start to use a walking stick, and he started to fall at that stage fairly regularly. Sometimes he fell and, and didn't hurt himself. Other times he would fall and hurt himself quite badly. And most people would have gone home at least and maybe to hospital, but Stephen would continue. But Hawking was no longer struggling alone. He had fallen in love with a 20-year-old language student from St Albans, Jane Wilde. They announced their engagement in October 1964. Both families were really thinking it might die a natural death because they were both very young and, they'd, and Stephen had been given two years to live and she was very young to be taking on anything like that. So everybody tried to discourage her, but she was not to be discouraged. We didn't really quite realise you know, how, how firm it was, but it was. it was. Hawking's form of motor neurone disease was rare and little understood. After only a few months, to the doctor's surprise, its progress slowed. Although he still faced an early death, for Stephen it was a glimmer of hope. I don't see that it's a coincidence 
but he did really do very little work until this point. When Stephen was told that he probably only had a very short time to live, I think he was determined that he would leave behind him something of real value, and that that was what spurred him on to, to start working. My initial reaction to learning I had an incurable condition was that it wasn't worth doing any work because I wouldn't finish my PhD. But then my condition began to develop less rapidly and my research took off. Hawking was only 21 when he was told he had a rare form of motor neurone disease. Not knowing how long he had to live, he was determined to make his mark in his chosen field, cosmology. For his PhD research, he turned to the origins of the universe. This would lead to one of the most brilliant pieces of work he would ever do. In theoretical physics, scientists use equations to build mathematical models that describe what they believe is happening in our universe. Hawking became interested in the work of Roger Penrose, a mathematician who'd been calculating what happens at the heart of a black hole. What Roger said was that anything that falls into a black hole has to go to a singularity, which is, which is just a point in the middle. Everything has to hit this singularity. If Einstein's general theory of relativity is right, then the singularity is where everything is crushed out of existence and disappears from our universe as far as we know. What Hawking did was to show that our universe, which we know is expanding, must have come from a singularity and it must move outwards initially very uniformly, but then as time passes, interesting things like galaxies begin to appear and form out of the matter that's coming out from the singularity. Hawking showed the Big Bang at the beginning of time was like the creation of a black hole in reverse. Stephen was certainly an original thinker, I mean, that's, that's clear, and was able to take my argument and, in a sense, turn it round in time. So the black hole singularity is, if you like, a singularity is in the future. That's the end of time in the future and the Big Bang is the beginning of time. There has to be a beginning, if you like, a and in the black holes there has to be an end. This was a very impressive thing to do in a PhD. Shortly after, in July 1965, the 23-year-old Dr. Stephen Hawking married Jane Wilde. He'd got himself a job as a research fellow at the Department of Applied Maths and Theoretical Physics at Cambridge, and the newlyweds moved into a tiny house close to the university. It wasn't a terribly difficult decision to take to marry Stephen, because at that time, every day one read reports in the newspapers that, oh, a uh, nuclear war was likely to break out in the next um, year or two. People were saying they weren't going to have children because there was going to be a nuclear war. And the fact that Stephen had been diagnosed as only having a couple of years to live didn't really seem to be very much different from the situation that was facing the rest of us anyhow. He really was in a rather pathetic state. I think he'd lost the will to live or he was very confused, certainly. And I think gradually, together, we realised that we could do something. Two years later, against all expectation, they had their first child, Robert. He and we have a great deal to thank Jane for, because not many people would have agreed to have children with Stephen. And nobody expected it, because um, he was to be dead in two years. And it was more than two years before Robert was born. Although Stephen seemed to be cheating death, the disease was making insidious progress. By the time their second child, Lucy, was born in 1970, Stephen was confined to a wheelchair. And he just refused to die. Well, I think Jane was really convinced that, um, you know, she could cure him. And I suppose in a way she certainly inspired him. <laughs> 